Convidamos para compor a mesa o decano do Conselho Universitário e vice-reitor em exercício da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, professor José Marco Silva Nogueira. Boa noite a todos, todas. Good night. Good evening. Uh, 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 We, I would like to, to invite to the, the table Professor uh, Lyle Campbell, please. And uh, and Professor Fabrício. So uh, we starting uh, the the, the, con the conference that, that celebrate the 90 years of the uh, UFMG, and tonight we have a, a talk by Professor uh, Lyle Campbell. Uh, I'd, I'd like to to invite Professor Fabrício to introduce Professor Campbell. Boa noite, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here to introduce Professor Lyle Campbell. And Professor Lyle Campbell is a linguist with degree in archaeology and anthropology, and specialist in historical linguistics, and particularly in Native American languages, developing many new projects about cataloging of indigenous languages and also languages that are currently on the uh, threat of extinction, in, particularly here in South America. And currently, Professor Lyle Campbell uh, teaches linguistics in the University of Hawaii, United States, and also participates as a visiting professor in many universities around the world. He published, he published more than 20 books and around 200 articles uh, related to linguistics and historical linguistics. And he has two very important books for our area because uh, we are in a multidisciplinary area interested in, in history and linguistics is a very important tool for us. For instance, in 98, he published the book Historical Linguistics. It's kind of a, a manual book for linguistics applied to history reconstruction. And the year 2000, he also published a book that we use a lot. It's called American Indian Language, the Historical Linguistics of Native America. That is exactly what he's going to talk about to us. And uh, I would like to 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 tell you, you as well that he is here also as invited to participate in an international symposium that we are organizing starting now. This is the inaugural letter as well that we are going to discuss about the South American prehistory. It is a multidisciplinary symposium, it's a very unusual type of conference that not many of us have the, the access to that because we are uh, linguists, archaeologists, biologists, physical anthropologists, social anthropologists, archaeologists doing different things like paleoparasitologists, for instance. And so these different areas, they have a common sense. They, they try to reconstruct history in base of their own evidence. But they, when they go to meetings, they have to talk only with the people from the same area. So this will be an amazing experience for us to have all of these people together maybe fighting, maybe getting to consensus, but it is something that we need to do, you know? because history is a precious thing that we, we believe that we need to put together all of these minds, different perspectives, to reconstruct something le less biased that we can do, just doing, uh, seeing what we, we see usually in our own areas, our own disciplines. So thank you very much, Professor Lyle, for accepting to come. We are very honored 
and we, we would like to thank the university here in the name of the vice rector and that actually they, they gave us the support since many months ago that we start discussing about this possibility so it is really is an honor for us to have you here and all of the support of the university that uh, I, I think it's an amazing initiative and support. Thank you, Fabrizio. <laughs> so I think that I uh, will let you to, to give your talk. Thank you. Uh, we'll stay there. Thank you, Professor uh, Santos, for the introduction. Can you hear me? It doesn't seem very loud. Well, it's a great honor for me to be here. It's a great pleasure to be in uh, Belo Horizonte. Uh, and it's a great honor to be invited to give the inaugural talk for this conference that starts tomorrow, but also uh, to be part of the celebration for the 90 years of the university. These are all very exciting things. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm going to talk about the, I, I think I'll be looking this way very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about the linguistic perspectives on South American past. In fact, I don't know about this. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can see. Well, let's see how it works. Okay, so the title of the talk is Linguistic Perspectives on South America's Past. And I'll talk about linguistic perspectives uh, from several of the themes that will be in the International Conference, South American uh, Prehistory, Populating the Diverse Landscapes of South America. I, I thought I would talk about all the themes, but the talk became four hours long, and so it will only be some themes. Uh, sometimes linguists use strange methods, and so in some of the examples, I'll illustrate some of the methods we use to get at linguistic prehistory. First theme is settlement of the Americas, linguistic perspectives. Uh, the main question is what really happened and how can we find out about it? Uh, and what can linguistics offer? A classification of the indigenous languages of the Americas has played an important role in the research on the peopling of the Americas from the very beginning of anthropological research up until today. Uh, however, <laughs> uh, the linguistic picture is compatible with most hypotheses for the first settlement of the Americas and therefore it does not, oh, it does not offer much help. We must be careful about many claims uh, regarding the early settlement of the Americas based on American Indian languages. Uh, so some pre preliminary information about uh, migrations or movements. Uh, uh, were the first Americans, were the first <laughs> immigrants to America part of a single migration or a continuous movement, but only one? Uh, did people come in multiple migrations to the New World? Were there many different entries? Uh, were there incentives to come here? Were people pulled to the Americas, or did they leave the old world? Oh, did they leave the old world? Uh, were they pushed from the old world? Uh, did different groups influence one another, displace one another, repel or attract one another uh, in this new environment? Uh, or was the arrival on this continent simply an accident? Now some preliminaries about linguistic diversity in the Americas. Uh, this, is the, this is what we have to work with. There are 173 independent language families, including language isolates in the Americas. These are independent linguistic lineages. 56 in North America, 10 independent ones in Mexico and Central America, and 108 language families in South America. Uh, South America has great linguistic diversity. Uh, linguists believe that many of these, uh, 
many of these 173 groups may be related to one another, but we can't show it with our methods. Uh, we believe that the first settlement in the Americas was, was so long ago, and the amount of linguistic change that has taken place is so much, that we simply cannot show that there are fewer than 173 different independent language families in the Americas, or 108 independent language families in South America. So here are some scenarios for the origins of languages in the Americas, different hypotheses. One is that there was simply a single movement into the Americas, and there was only one language in that movement. This view is not favored by linguists, at least by almost no linguists. Uh, it implies that all the languages here are phylogenetically related. Uh, it's a, the view is favored by uh, some geneticists, though. So here's a quote from uh, Raghavan et al. The ancestors of present-day Native Americans include Athabascans, Amerindians, uh, including Athabascans and Amerindians, entered Amer the, America, the Americas as a single migration wave from Siberia. And uh, there are others that follow this. The genetic information then isn't necessarily consistent with the linguistic information if there are genetic markers of a single entry. Uh, another hypothesis is that there were three distinct movements into the Americas, or maybe a few, but not many. Many linguists think this is plausible, but we don't have the evidence from languages to confirm this at all. Uh, this view is favored by a number of geneticists, uh, here's an example from uh, Reich et al. Uh, here we show that Native, American, Native Americans descend from at least three streams of Asian genes. Um, the question then is, could so much linguistic diversity develop in the time that has elapsed since the first people entered the Americas? Uh, the received opinion, the date of 12,000 and something before the present, uh, for entry of humans into the New World is, as you know, very controversial. Uh, for linguists, it doesn't really matter much whether it's this date or a few thousand years earlier because the linguistic information is not going to tell us anything about the date anyway. The only thing that would matter is if it were a long time ago so that more diversity could have developed in the amount of time that we had. Another hypothesis is that there may have been multilingual migrations, migrations that had several languages in each migration. Uh, there may have been one migration with several languages or several migrations with several languages. Another hypothesis is, and these are the less plausible ones, uh, these are claims that people came to the Americas from Africa, Australia, China, India, Japan, Polynesia, that people associated with the lost tribes of Israel, Egyptians, Phoenicians, Greeks, Romans, Welsh, Irish, Vikings came to the New World and are responsible for the languages here. Uh, there, are no, there is no reliable linguistic evidence to support any of these hypotheses. Uh, however, <laughs> some geneticists have, have uh, claimed some connections beyond the Americas. So for example, we have this one article that claims that uh, Botokudo, Botokudo and uh, Polynesian are connected. This apparently is a, an error in a museum where skulls from Polynesia were misplaced and put in a box with Botokudo. Uh, another example is uh, from geneticists is the link between Rapa Nui, Easter Island, and uh, the Americas. Linguist see no evidence of that, and I think most geneticists haven't picked up on it and followed it, I'm not sure. Uh, there are other connections that are proposed. So here from uh, Skuglund is, and et al. is, some Amazonian Native Americans descend partly from the Native American founding population that carried uh, ancestry more closely related to indigenous Australians, New Guineans, and Andaman Islanders. Uh, than any present-day Euro Eurasian or Native Americans. Um, 
Well, from a linguistic perspective, there is no credible linguistic evidence of any relationship between New World and Old World languages. So whatever the genetic markers may be for this, there is no linguistic evidence of it. Uh, then there are extremist claims about the origin of languages in the America, that they came from the lost continent of Atlantis or the lost continent of Mu or from Mars or Venus or wherever. But even the, the unfortunate thing is even these extremist views are not incompatible with what we currently know based on American Indian languages. All we know is that there are 173 groups and we don't know how they got here and when they got here. Uh, so we can sort of throw these out, but not because the linguistic evidence tells us to. Uh, it has been known for, from the beginning of anthropological research that there is a mismatch between the seeming biological uniformity and the linguistic diversity of the Americas. There are simply many distinct language families in the Americas and the circumstances under which they came to exist and to reach their current locations are mostly unknown. Let me ask, the, the, I feel sorry for the translator. Am I talking too fast? Is it going okay? <laughs> okay. So linguistics, therefore, is, is not, uh, will not contribute significantly to determining the number of migrations, the manner of entry, nor the earliest date of movement into the Americas. Uh, we're going to have to rely on genetics and archaeology and other sorts of information for that. We know next to nothing about how much time is required to produce extensive linguistic diversity, particularly on a virgin continent. With no idea of how many different languages were brought to the Americas or how much time really uh, would be required to develop the extant linguistic diversity, we cannot insist on any current hypothesis for populating the new world. But it's not all that dismal. There are some things we know for certain. We know some things are wrong. So there are some unproductive claims. Uh, for example, even though our knowledge isn't perfect, Joseph Greenberg's classification of the American Indian languages is rejected by all linguists, uh, as far as I know. Uh, not all linguists, almost all linguists. Uh, uh, his classification was that all Native American languages except Nadine and Eskimo Aleut belong to his proposed Amerin grouping. If it were up to linguists, we would just say no and pass over and not talk about Greenberg. The problem is that many geneticists like to follow Greenberg, and so I'll tell you why linguists don't like him, don't like his work, his, his claim. Uh, so he claimed, following Sapir and others, that the Americas were settled by three population movements, Amerind, Nadine, and, Esquimo, Esquimo, and Aleut Eskimo in his term, uh, in that order. Uh, it's ironic, however, that he claimed non-linguistic support for his language classification. Uh, he, he thought the genetics supported his classification, the human genetics, because there's a principle in linguistics that says that non-linguistic information is irrelevant for classifying the languages. If you rely on myths or, or genes or culture, you simply end up with things that, that are not uh, supportable by linguistic me, uh, methods. So Amerind has been rejected by all specialists, uh, though geneticists have followed Greenberg's view. Valid methods do not at present permit reduction of Native American languages to fewer than 173 independent lineages. Uh, his classification and Amerind in particular have been criticized on many grounds, and I won't give all of them to you, I'll just give you some of them. Uh, the extensive inaccuracies in the data so as uh, Willem La uh, Adelar says, the number of erroneous forms probably exceeds that of the correct forms. Uh, another problem is the excessive semantic latitude. He compares words from different languages that have very different meanings. So he compares a word in one language that means excrement with a word in another language which means night with a word in another language which means grass. And he believes that this is evidence of all of these words having a common origin. But semantic difference like that just increases the probability that chance or accident explains any similarity in the compared words. 
so he has lots of misidentified languages or languages that are just not languages and are wrong. My favorite is that Membreño is a language in the Lenca family, according to Greenberg, but Membreño isn't a language at all. It's a human being. It's a guy who wrote a book uh, with word lists in it. Uh, uh, he uh, misanalyzes words, and so if you misanalyze words, you can make them look more similar to words in other languages. So if you don't see the word divisions, you may think there's a similarity that doesn't exist. So here's Rama, a Chipchen language in uh, Nicaragua, and he looked at Mukwik, thought it meant hand, and thought, okay, this is like my Ameren word, Maki, but it turns out the Rama word has a prefix, mu, your, and then the root, quick hand. So if you only look at the hand part, quick doesn't look like Maki, or at least not very much. So by not finding the word division, it looks more similar than it is. And then the next part of this is he made false word divisions with no evidence. So here's an example from uh, Chipchen Paisen is a, a, a large group that he proposes as a sub-family of Amerind. And he has a, 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 he compares several languages and says there was a word that used to mean ax. Uh, he only has four languages actually for this. Out of the many languages it, that he believes belong to this, he only has four. He, this is the example, Bashita, which means machete. He didn't know it was borrowed from Spanish. It's a loan word from Spanish, machete. And he put the division in, even though there is no division. Well, this is a language which has, that everything has to be nasalized, so you have to have nasalized consonants and vowels, or non-nasalized. So the only choices would be something like manina or bashita, all nasal or non-nasal. Uh, but by putting this false morpheme boundary, this false word boundary, it makes it look like bashi is closer to kabekar bak and andaki boho. So he's created false similarity that isn't there in this erroneous stuff. We saw a loan word just a minute ago, but I'll add loan words. Lots of, lots of loan words were missed. So in this same set, meaning axe in this branch, uh, he compared Cuitlatec way up in Mexico with these South American languages. He compared Navajo, which is from Spanish, Navajo, Navajo. Uh, and uh, so it's another loan word that he missed. Uh, so in this particular set, there are only four comparisons, and two of them are loan words. Uh, we talked about many errors. Uh, there are many, many errors in the data, and there are just spurious forms, forms that don't exist at all. So he has Quapa, a language, a Siouan language in the southeast of the U.S., except that none of the words that he calls Quapa are from Quapa at all. There are no Quapa data. All of the words are from Boloxi or Ofu. Uh, so every, every word that he labels as Quapa is spurious. I won't give you all of these other reasons why linguists criticize it, but you've seen enough, I think. So where, where Greenberg's method of multilateral comparison stops, after assembling superficial similarities and declaring them to be due to descent from common ancestor is where other scholars begin. Similarities among languages can be due to chance borrowing, onomatopoeia, sound symbolism, nursery words, the mama, papa, nana, dada, kaka sort, and these misanalysis like we saw of those words, and also to inheritance. He just assumes all similarities are inheritance and he doesn't look at any of these others. Uh, a plausible proposal of a phylogenetic relationship among languages must eliminate these other possible explanations, leaving inheritance from a common ancestor most likely. Greenberg made no attempt to eliminate these other explanations. His similarities are due mostly to accident and to a combination of other factors. Uh, in short, it is with very good reason that Amerind has been rejected. So, it turns out that some geneticists 
have figured out that Greenberg's amaranth isn't so good, but nevertheless they imagine that some of these sub-branches of amaranth that Greenberg proposed might be a place to look at for hypotheses, uh, but none of the branches of amaranth are supported either by linguistic evidence. They're just as bad as amaranth. They're not less problematic. And so I'll give you one example just to show you why you shouldn't look below amaranth at subgroups. Uh, here's just one case. His Greenberg's proposed macro Panoan. He uh, believes that Panoan, Takanan, Moseten, Matakuan, Waikuruan, Charuan, Lula, Vilela, and Mascoyan languages all belong to this one group. He has 60 set, 62 sets of words that he believes shows this. It's a very small number for trying to prove anything in linguistics, but every single one of his 62 sets of words is, has problems, major problems. I'll just show you a few of them so you can see what's going on. So the very first one, he says, means to be able, and he only compares two of the languages from the many that could possibly uh, have been involved in this set. But in the Niwakle word, the, uh, this word doesn't exist. There is no such language. There is no such word. It's just a spurious form. Uh, the second one, the same thing. There's a word he thinks means animal in a few of these languages. In Wichi, he gives shlokwe. Uh, there is no such word in Wichi. Or there is such a word, but it means pot uh, or jug. It does not mean animal. So these are just spurious forms. They don't, they don't exist. Uh, here's one that he gives a label of anus to. And it, if you look at the various examples in the various languages, in one language it means buttocks or anus. In another it means tail. In another it means open. In another opening. And in another hole. In other words, semantic, uh, semantic latitude of a, a large sort. Uh, here's, an, here's another example. The set he labels as awake, he compares these languages. So he compares Inambi and Nama to, to Nom in Wichi. The problem here is that Nom is really the root Om to arrive, not exactly to awake, plus a prefix that means toward the speaker. So. Uh, where did it go? So he just misanalyzed the, the, the word boundaries here. Well, if you look at Om, it doesn't look so much like Nambi or Nama anymore. And so on. Uh, one last one. He compares a few words that have, you know, for mother, uh, Nana, Nane, and so forth. This is a sort of word that shows up in language after language after language all over the world. And the nana, 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 mama, papa, dada sorts of words. Okay, so the upshot of all of that is don't follow Greenberg if you're going to do human biological genetic research. Uh, do lang this is a sub theme related to that. Do languages and genes correlate? There is no de deterministic connection between languages and gene pools. People can learn new la a new language, they can abandon their original language but cannot learn new genes nor abandon old ones. Languages become extinct in populations that survive genetically. I think most people nowadays understand this, but uh, there's still a lot of research that doesn't seem to. So does the common linguistic ancestry mean, does a common linguistic ancestry mean a common biological ancestry? The frequent assumption is that there's parallel descent, coevolution between language and genes it is assumed that if two or more languages are phylogenetically related, then the genes of the speakers of these languages will also be similar. Uh, it is assumed that coevolution will contribute to understanding prehistory of these populations. This view is not shared by linguists. The coevolution, the, the, the parallel evolution, uh, uh, it's not shared necessarily by archaeologists either. Uh, not in South America, in Europe perhaps more. Uh, at least, this is a quote from uh, Nevis. Uh, since the, at least the 1960s, 
there have been many cases, many case studies demonstrating that there is no universal correlation between language and material culture. Uh, so, it shouldn't be necessary to prove that there's not a good correlation between languages and genes, but let me just give you some information about languages being replaced when genes aren't replaced. Uh, so linguistic replacement is very frequent. Uh, we know at least 639 languages that we have good information on that are extinct. And of course, many, many others that are extinct that we don't have good information on. Uh, the populations for most of these are not extinct, only the language, they shifted to other languages. All the languages of 97 language families are extinct. The world only has 407 language families, more or less. That's 24%, about a quarter of the linguistic diversity of the world calculated in terms of language families is just lost, it's gone. Most populations that speak these languages didn't die out, they shifted to other languages. The Catalog of Endangered Languages lists over 3,000 endangered languages. Many of them will soon become extinct. Uh, and to mention just one well-known case from our area of interest, uh, along the Rio Negro, speakers of several Eastern Tucanoan and Arawakan languages replaced their languages with Nyangatu. Uh, so the point of all this is that language replacement is, is quite common. Uh, there are 329 indigenous languages still spoken in South America. All are endangered to one degree or another. It's uncertain how many languages were spoken in South America at the time when the Europeans first came. Uh, an estimate that sometimes is given is about 800 languages. Often people cite Lukotka's 1492 languages, but it's got lots of mistakes in it. Uh, of the still spoken languages, 38 have fewer than 10 speakers, 73 have fewer than 100 speakers. These are, these are very endangered. Uh, in summary, <laughs> languages are frequently replaced. Uh, languages are frequently replaced, but the people survive. Therefore, it is misguided to expect linguistic and human genetic history to run parallel. For geneticists, the null hypothesis, at least in many genetic papers, has been that there would be a correlation between genes and languages. Uh, linguists, uh, don't ha linguists don't have this null hypothesis at all. The null hypothesis of linguists is just the opposite, that in most cases we expect linguistic admixture and genetic admixture in the same population. So here are the possible situations you could have no linguistic admixture and no genetic admixture. This is the one the geneticists, until recently, expected to find most often. And you can get no linguistic admixture, some and genetic ad admixture, or linguistic admixture and no genetic admixture, or the one linguists expect, admixture in the languages and admixture in the genes. Uh, so our null hypothesis is that everything has admixture is just the opposite of the genetic one that says there's no admixture in either. Uh, much work in, by geneticists relied on that one, no admixture. Linguists rely on lots of admixture. Uh, so to repeat, it's an error to expect parallelism between human genetic and linguistic classifications. Despite the cumulative Despite accumulation of cases where no robust correlation between languages and genes was found, the expectation of coevolution of language and genes persists in, in a number of genetic publications. So just to cite one, Packendorf in 2014. Uh, collaboration between linguists and geneticists can be very productive, however, since both have sophisticated methods for dealing with both vertical relationships, inheritance, and horizontal ones, uh, borrowing and and gene flow. Uh, linguistic information provides valuable historical insights regardless of whether there is congruence in the human genetic uh, cladistic picture. For example, in Indo-European, in Proto-Indo-European, we know that spe the speakers had horses, cows, wagons, tribal kings, and so forth. We know this from the reconstructed vocabulary 
via the comparative method, this provides invaluable historical information regardless of whether we know the precise genetic history of these people or who their present day lineal uh, descendants are. And uh, we cannot, oh, we cannot ignore such information when trying to understand prehistory. Linguistics in this way can and does contribute much to understanding the prehistory of South America using these kinds of methods. Uh, let me Sorry about that. It's much drier here than in Hawaii. Uh, so moving on, moving on to another theme uh, in the conference, language family distribution patterns and dispersal processes in the, in the area of cultural history and pre-Columbian, of pre-Columbian South America. Uh, well, as I said before, there's extensive linguistic diversity in the Americas, 173 language families of the 407 known in the world, that is 42.5% of all the linguistic diversity in all the world is in the Americas, if we calculate it in terms of independent language families. Uh, to look at South America, very famous for linguistic diversity, there are 108 independent language families. That's 26.5% of all the world's linguistic diversity. And South America has nearly two thirds of the linguistic diversity of, of the linguistic diversity of the Americas. Uh, so I'll I'll give you a whole bunch of language names which you won't have time to look at. If you want to have these, just write to me on email and I'll send you the the slides so you can see them. Uh, or anything you didn't understand, I can send it to you. Uh, be very happy to do that. So in in South America. We have some larger families, nine larger families, larger in geographical area and in the number of languages. So la families that have more than six member languages are these, Arawakan, uh, Caribbean, uh, Chapakuran, Chipchan, Jayan, uh, Panatakanan, uh, Quechua, uh, Tucano Tucanoan, and Tupian. Clear enough. And then we have 44 small families that have two to six languages, and these are they. And then we have 54 language isolates. These are language families that have only one language in them. So these are languages which have no known relatives, and there are many of them. As I said, if you want to see these write to me and I will send it to you so you can see all the names. Uh, explaining, the ver uh, explaining these variable patterns of linguistic diversity in Amazonia poses a major challenge to scholars of linguistic prehistory, thanks to Patty Epps who's here with us. <laughs> uh, geography is not a sufficient explanation since South American diversity is concentrated in the lowlands where there are few natural obstacles. Expansion of many language families appears to have been along major rivers. Agriculture does not explain the language spread either. The Amazonian linguistic diversity is scattered across the map. Nearly all groups practice at least some agriculture. Thank you, Dr. Epps again. <laughs> uh, another major challenge is explaining and reconciling the great linguistic diversity with the human biological commonalities. Okay, so some implications of this classification of languages that you just saw uh, for dispersal. Uh, we have methods in linguistics to look at the point of origin, the original, original place of dispersal called linguistic homeland. There are two methods. One is linguistic migration theory. Uh, it's based on the classification of the languages and their geographical di distribution. So where the maximum phylogenetic diversity is and where the minimum number of moves is needed to move all the languages back to that place, 
is the homeland, the center of gravity. Uh, the other method is, uh, is uh, looking at reconstructed vocabulary for geographical and ecological clues that tell us about where people must have been. And so we combine these two methods to find the homelands, the original place of these language families. Uh, just one example from Thiago uh, Chacon. Uh, this is the Tucanoan languages. Uh, as you can see, there are several off in the west and several off in the east and a few in the middle. Uh, the homeland of Proto-Tucanoan, uh, I'll just read this. On the basis of, of greatest linguistic diversity and fewest moves, uh, Chacon uh, places the Proto-Tucanoan homeland in the, the zone between the Apaporis and the Chaquet Chaqueta rivers. Uh, and you can see that it's more or less here. Uh, and I wish we had more time to talk about this, but using the comparative method, we can find out about the cultural inventory of all these groups. So. Uh, Thiago Chacon, in his reconstruction, finds that uh, the broad knowledge, proto uh culture, had broad knowledge of jungle resources, including some domesticated plants, manioc to plant, yam, sweet potato, chili, tobacco. And they also knew ceramics, hammocks, woven baskets, and so forth. The picture of proto tucanoan society is very general, found in other Amazonian societies, Proto-Tucanoans shared fundamental traits with other Amazonian groups. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this one, but this is uh, the Proto-Tupian homeland from uh, Arion Rodriguez and uh, Ana Sueli Cabral. Uh, and their hypothesis is that the speakers of Proto-Tupian uh, Proto were in the area between the, the Waupare and the uh, Aripu, uh, Puan, uh, Aripuan, uh, uh, rivers, uh, so in this general area between them. And five of the ten Tupian subfamilies are in this, this region, and then they have a very good story about how the other five migrated along the rivers to get to where they are, uh, spread into different areas. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have time to talk about these others, but I'll just mention them. We have hypotheses about the Arawakan homeland, about the Caribbean homeland, several hypotheses about Quechua homeland. Maybe Paul will set us straight. <laughs> uh, and uh, Chibchen, Chibchen homeland, uh, uh, and uh, it would be good for geneticists and archaeologists to look at these regions that are postulated as the homelands of these, of these language families. Uh, settlement in South, uh, so this is an, another theme settlement areas of South America. Importantly, linguists don't look just at family trees, the cladistic classification, but we look also at the history of the languages in contact and the diffusion across linguistic areas, so the lateral transmission. It's very important in South America. In, in terms of diffusion and lateral transmission, an important uh, method or concept is the linguistic area a linguistic area is just a geographical area where different languages share structural traits that they borrowed from others. Uh, so to give you one example, the Chaco, a postulated linguistic area, uh, it's also a culture area characterized by shared cultural traits across these various ethnic boundaries. It has 20 languages or 20 ethnic groups or more in six families. So Waikuru and Matakuan, Mascoyan, Lulubilelan, Samukuan, and Tupi Guaranian. And they share a number of traits, but this is important. I can't go through all of these, we don't have time. But the, the traits that they share are subject, verb, object, word order. As you see, most of the languages in the Chaco do have that word order, but Lula and Vilela don't. So, and then languages outside of the Chaco also have this word order. This is the pattern we're going to see over and over and over again is that some trait will be shared by a number of languages in the area, but not all, 
and will be shared by languages outside the area. Uh, so the gender, the grammatical gender is another trait. It's shared by these various language families, but not all Chaco languages. But it's also shared by other South American languages. And that's the main, if, if you want to, uh, I'll send this to you if you write and ask, and then you can study all of these traits in, in detail. Uh, so few traits are shared by most Chaco languages. Most traits also extend into other areas, overlapping languages in the Andes and, the, and Amazonia and in the Cone or Fuegoan, Fuegan area. Uh, this is not surprising since the Chaco is a culture area. As a culture, as a culture area, is also not distinguished clearly from surrounding culture areas. Chaco groups underwent cultural influences from many directions. The linguistic traits shared among and beyond the Chaco languages appear to parallel the distribution of the cultural traits shared among and beyond ethnic groups in that area. Uh, Amazonian, Amazonia is another linguistic area and uh, it has a number of traits that have been uh, identified as shared amongst many of the languages of the Amazon, though again, just like in the Chaco, not all languages share all of these traits, and many of these traits are shared beyond the Amazonian region. And I'll just skip the rest of these. Another linguistic area is the Andes, and as you can see this quote from Dixon and Eichenwald, there's no sharp boundary between the Andean and Amazonian linguistic areas. They tend to flow into each other. Uh, some other langu linguistic, uh, some other linguistic areas. Uh, I'm going to. So, so there are a number of these linguistic areas that have been identified where there's lots of contact and lots of linguistic borrowing. Uh, the linguistic, the linguistic areas of South America are not self-contained independent regions. Rather, they exhibit patterns of diffusion that extend beyond these regions. Uh, the contacts, both within the areas and across linguistic areas, demonstrated by the shared linguistic traits, are important clues for the understanding of the prehistory of South America. So this was, this was the punchline of all those areas, that, that these linguistic areas, with all the contact they exhibit, should be important for understanding cultural contact in, in, in South America. Much linguistic diversity in South America is apparently not due to isolation. Uh, there was much contact and trade, especially in Amazonia, within and across, within and across regions. There was, re there was relative cultural homoge homogeneity in regions of extensive linguistic diversity. I'll say this one again, I didn't say it well. So in, in South America, in, at least in Amazonia, there's relative cultural homogeneity in spite of linguistic diversity in, in, in the region. Uh, Dr. Epps again argues that, strong, that the strong equation of language and identity helped maintain ethnic diversity in spite of shared culture. Linguistic differentiation in Amazonia has in fact had more to do with contact, uh, with the contact that has pertained among groups than with isolation. So identity is more important than isolation. Uh, understanding linguistic areas then is important for examining both contact and dispersal of cultures and populations in South America uh, and for comprehending, comprehending South American prehistory. The linguistic areas shaped by intensive ethnic, linguistic, and genetic interactions provide important grounds for archeologists and geneticists to examine hypotheses about contact, trade, intermarriage, intermarriage dispersal, and other things. Associated with, associated with this is uh, this kind of diversity that we're talking about and the contact and the interaction is the question of linguistic exogamy and multilingual societies. The Valpes area is well known for its linguistic exogamy. 20 different languages and ethnic groups where you must marry someone who speaks a different language uh, I wanted to give you an example from my own work from uh, Misión La Paz in Argentina and Salta province. Uh, it's on the Pilcomayo River, 
just across the river from Paraguay and 20 kilometers down the river from Bolivia. They speak three languages here, uh, Chorote, Niuacle, and Wichi. They're all Matakwan, but they're very different uh, language. They're very different from one another. They're not very similar, at least not like Guaranian languages or Romance languages. Uh, here's a different map of Argentina. And here's the region in Paraguay. So these are the languages that we're talking about. In Mission La Paz, there is linguistic exogamy, so marriages between people who speak different languages. When they marry, each spouse speaks his or her own language and is addressed in and understands the other spouse's language in return. A spouse does not accommodate by speaking the other spouse's language. So the husband speaks one language and the wife speaks another language all the time. Uh, they also have linguistic dualism, which is what this is. Uh, speakers and hearers in Mission La Paz in conversations typically are not speaking the same language. People communicate regularly with speakers of different languages, but rarely speaking the same language. So this dualingualism is, is uh, what's involved. It's, uh, it's highly institutionalized here. I'll just give you one example. So here's a typical family. Uh, this is uh, Elite and Anita. Uh, Elite speaks Chorote and understands the other two, but does not speak them. Neva Clay is her language that she speaks and identifies with. She understands the other two, but does not speak them. People claim they do not speak the other languages in town. They only understand them. Uh, Elite also knows Spanish. Uh, so he speaks Chorote to his wife, Anita. She speaks Neva Clay to him. In fact, he speaks Chorote to everybody in the world, and she speaks Neva Clay to everyone in the world. And uh, this is their youngest son who lives in the same household, and his wife, Valeriana. Uh, Franco speaks Chorote. He understands these others, speaks Spanish well. Uh, Valeriana uh, speaks Wichi. She understands the other two and speaks Spanish well. And so, she, so he speaks Chorote to his wife. Uh, his wife speaks Wichi back to him. And of course, they speak this. So in this household, there are trilingual conversations. All three of these languages are be being spoken all day long in this house. And this is not unusual for this community. These social, social cultural facts of language use and choice, uh, such as linguistic exogamy and dual lingualism, have implications for the interpretation of ethnic, uh, of ethnic groups and their interactions in prehistory. Here, clearly, human population genetics does not match closely linguistic identity or phylogeny, linguistic phylogeny. It is obviously not the case, at least in a number of instances in South America, uh, that humans do not tend easily to easily cross language boundaries in choosing a partner. Here you must cross linguistic boundaries to choose your partner. This is from a genetics paper uh, by uh, Barbujani. Uh, the existence of uh, situations of linguistic exogamy clearly con uh, confounds the assumption of parallel transmission of language and genes. These cases have implications for the kinds of cultural patterns and interactions that may be expected uh, today and also in the past. And that's it, so let me just read the conclusions. Uh, linguistics can and does contribute significantly to understanding South American prehistory. Uh, however, linguistics is unable to help answer most questions about the earliest peopling of the Americas. The linguistic information is compatible with most hypotheses about the earliest people in the New World. Greenberg's classification is, is out. Don't pay any attention to it. Uh, it is mistaken to assume parallel evolution that linguistic history and human biological history will correlate. Well, uh, language extinction is frequent in populations that survive. Multilingual populations and ling linguistic exogamy confound parallel evolution. Uh, nevertheless, genetic findings can suggest hypotheses for linguists to test, just as linguistic findings can suggest hypotheses for geneticists and archaeologists to investigate. And when the genetics or archaeological information and linguistic findings do match, though this is, well, not so much in archaeology, when the genetics and linguistic findings match, though this is rare and not to be expected, these are very valuable instructive cases.
there is extensive ling linguistic diversity in South America, the greatest of any region in the world in terms of language families. These language families and their <sighs> these language families and their distributions provide important information for understanding the prehistory of the continent. Uh, the investigation of linguistic homelands of language families is valuable for understanding prehistory and can offer fruitful hypotheses for examining correlations with archaeology and human genetics. Linguistic areas are important for the study of horizontal developments, patterns of diffusion. More work is needed uh, to examine correlations of linguistic areas and the patterns of contact and interaction they, they reflect. Uh, correlations with archaeological and human genetic uh, research. The implications of and consequences of multilingualism, linguistic exogamy and dualingualism, uh, and horizontal changes in general for hypotheses and interpretations of prehistory need to be taken more carefully into account and investigated more extensively. The cultural, interp the cultural, cultural inventory of reconstructed vocabulary done by the comparative method of proto-languages provides valuable historical information. The great diversity of languages in South America still lacks explanation. The hypothesis that a strong equation of language and identity helped create and maintain ethnic diversity in spite of shared uh, culture and much contact bears further investigation. Uh, while maintenance of ethnic and linguistic identity appear to be strong motives in the Valpes region, the extent to which ethnic and linguistic identity may be less rigid or more fluid in other regions needs to be carefully investigated. Uh, I, let me say one last thing. So in, in speciation, isolation is what leads to new species and in linguistics, People often imagine that when groups are isolated, then they will develop diverse languages. Uh, that's not what we're seeing here, is that there, there are groups that are in constant contact, nevertheless maintaining their linguistic diversity. So isolation is, not, is apparently not what's leading to speciation or the creation of new languages here. And that's it. Thank you very much. Here's the, there's a bibliography for anyone that wants to get this paper. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. So now I have time to take some questions about the audience. So Fabrizio can help us yes, if so needed. Well, we will we have, for the symposium, we will have some uh, three days to, to have a lot of discussion, but we, we can start now yes. with many people here around as well. So we do have a lot of questions for sure. We, we will get to the details later, but I have one central question here because uh, it seems that there is this confusion about the Amerin. We understand that, like, all of these are in situ differentiation of language that we have, that what Green Bay would call Amerin would be just a set of depend independent language with no correlation with Asian language, no? But what about Nadene and Eskimo? Wouldn't they be a sign of this constant gene flow or uh, demi flow from from Asian that they have connections? Uh, uh, I heard about this connection about the Dene Caucasian or Dene Yenese connections and the Eskimo that happens in Asia and also America. So, isn't it an evidence of uh, a constant flow of people and also culture between both continents? Uh, good question. Is it this is on, right? Uh, that's a very good question, and I, I was a little too simplistic in what I presented for the time's sake. There are claims about possible linguistic connections with Asia. The only one we can prove is some Eskimo groups that went back to Siberia. All of the others we cannot prove. We can only guess. So we hypothesize that perhaps Nadine or Athabascan may have come late and and later than many other American Indian groups, and that Eskimo Aleut must have come even later. 
And most linguists are sympathetic to that. We don't, we don't doubt that that was a possibility. It's just that when we apply our methods, we cannot prove that they ever came from Asia. We can only prove that they are different from others that are in the New World. Uh, and since we don't believe in Amaranth, then it may not be that there are many Amaranth languages and then these two other groups. It may be that there are just many groups and that Nadine and uh, Eskimo Aleut are just two of the many. There is the hypothesis by Edward Vida that claims that uh, Nadine and uh, Yenisean languages, Yenisean is a small family in central Siberia, thousands and thousands of kilometers from the Americas. And he presented evidence that many people like, but when you examine the evidence very, very carefully, uh, it doesn't work. And so uh, I at least reject it. And I hope others will read the evidence and also reject it. There are a few people who, however, who believe it uh, based on the, the evidence that he presented. But uh, it has the same sorts of flaws that we were looking in the methods here. Uh, it, it's too far in distance and too far in time to be as similar as, as, as they look in terms of the, the, the grammatical patterns. Happy to send information about that if anyone wants. Yeah. The audience? Yes. Yes. Um, so, uh, from the audience, you can also take a question in even Portuguese or in English, in, in Spanish, if need. And you can translate if need. I think. Well. So. Oh. Okay. I have a question coming back to the diversity of South American languages. You said that there's no good hypothesis to explain why South America is so diverse. But can you expand on what would be potential causes for this? Like, hypothesis for us to look at that could explain this? No. No. Uh, OK. Uh, no, I don't, I don't have any good hypotheses. There, there's some around. Uh, Patty's is about as good as it gets that, that uh, isolation wasn't what was going on, but a desire to have an identity that we, uh, but, but you know, there are many reasons why languages diversify. It's not all just economic determinism. It's not all geography. It's many social, cultural, and other reasons. And it may be that there were many different things involved in different kinds of diversification in South America, but I don't know. Uh, Next one. Yeah. Um, about overlapping uh, between uh, languages and, and genetics. I do think that uh, language is a, a good null hypothesis in order to start to, uh, to look for what genetics uh, talks. Uh, because uh, when two populations are mixed, um, if 50 people from one population and 50 people from another population and mix, you have half of uh, the of the DNA inherited from one population and half from the other, although uniparental markers can talk other histories. But uh, in languages, I think that uh, when two populations meet, usually one, popul one language substitutes the language of the other population. So until which point I'm wrong, until which, which point when two populations meet, uh, a new language can emerge, like a kind of Creole language can emerge uh, and has uh, two equal parents. Yeah, there, that's a good, is this on again? Yeah, that's a good question too. Uh, most, linguists, most linguists that work in uh, historical linguistics of the Americas aren't very excited about creolization, languages becoming, new languages developing because of pidgins or creoles. We do have a few cases, but the, the circumstances under which they develop are, are, are usually not met in the Americas. 
We have mixed languages where uh, two groups come together and, and mix part of one language with part of another. Almost all of those cases, there are very few in the entire world, half a dozen or so. In all of those, those are groups that usually because of some colonialization pressure are trying to create their own identity different from both the colonizers and the original groups. So we don't have many really good cases that we can look at to say that there should be mixed languages throughout the history of, of, of South America. If there were, we'd look at the linguistic evidence and hopefully there would be enough for us to show that some material is from one language and some, langu some material from another. But we don't see much of that. Uh, very, very few cases in all post, post, contest, post contact, I think. Uh, well, you you didn't talk too much about uh, language endangerment, just a little bit. But I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think is the current status of language uh, preservation and language re revitalization in South America and especially in Brazil, uh, if compared to other places with high linguistic diversity like Sub-Saharan Africa, Australia, Papua New Guinea, and so on? Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, there's languages are endangered all over the world. Uh, m many of the indigenous languages everywhere uh, are endangered, uh, but the the patterns of endangerment differ from from place to place. So in Australia, of 250 some odd languages, you know, 200 are highly endangered, and and 190 are extinct already, or something like that. The level of endangerment there is extremely high, as it is in North America. In North America, there are about 150 languages still spoken, but only 20 of them have children learning them, which means that in our lifetime, all those languages will become extinct unless programs of revitalization are successful. Uh, and we hope they will be. Australia has many language revitalization projects. Uh, North America has many. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has very few, uh, and uh, Brazil, I think there are many good linguists who, who work with indigenous groups, but I don't think they use exactly the same methods for revitalization that are used in, in other parts of the world. I think there's a good room in Brazil for many good people, linguists, community members, educators, whatever, uh, to work with communities to help them develop their own languages. Now in the Rio Negro area, uh, there are people who, who work regularly with, with groups to help them develop dictionaries, teaching programs, and things like that. And usually it's the groups themselves that determine what they want and ask the linguists to help them with either providing school uh, educational materials or or grammars and dictionaries, or recordings, or to produce stories, written things, whatever they ask for. So there is good work going on, but there's so many languages that are endangered that we need much more of it in Brazil. Was that the question you were asking? I was wondering about this uh, statement of uh, high diversity of languages in, in the New World in South America. It's very common that we hear there is a, a great number of languages. I was wondering if that actually reflects uh, a great overall diversity of just an intensified structuration within the continent. So when you say 26% of the languages of the world are here, does this actually mean that 26% of language variation worldwide is here, or just that we have several languages that are very similar to each other? You, you understand yes, my, I, my point? Yes, I do. So uh, the, the, what I was saying was that in South America we have greater concentration of linguistic families than anywhere else in the world. But the families in South America often are quite small with only a few languages. So there are, you know, there are many more languages in, in Africa than in South America, but most of them belong to Bantu, one very large family. Uh, now the languages in South America, these 108 families that I talked about are absolutely different. There's no connection whatsoever. And, and so, it would be comparable to, com taking two of those would be comparable to taking Indo-European and Chinese as, as, well, 
more or less, as comparisons. So the languages are similar within the families, but not similar across. People have argued that the reason that we have so much genetic diversity in South America is because we don't know what we're doing, that we haven't done the research, and that if we would just go out and do the research, we'd find out that all these languages are related. Well, we have done the research now in the last 20 years for many, many of these, and we hope in the future that research will help us reduce the total number, and it probably will reduce, not 108, but some, but it's not going to be a vast reduction. It's going to be very small because we already know a great deal about how these languages are related to one another. So the question of great diversity in South America is not going to go away. We will always have great linguistic diversity here. And I have a question about your point on the uh, isolation of native populations. No? So you talk about patients, apps. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, right. So uh, well, what we always think about isolation is not uh, complete isolation, it's relative isolation. We, 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 we claim that, for instance, people in the Amazon are relatively more isolated than populations in the Andean region in terms of the connection of populations, cultural connections. So uh, agriculture, that's much more developed there. So this brings people together, the complex society that we have in different of parts of the South America. So in this way, we talk about isolation, relative isolation. So we wouldn't expect that in regions like the Amazon, uh, we would, should have much more linguistic diversity that in, in these other areas with these cultural connections, not only in terms of language, but also in terms of other kinds of cultural traditions. Yeah, thanks. That's a good point, too. Um, so relative isolation would be important. I think, I, I think there are a couple of ways to look at it. So if we look at Amazonia as a linguistic area, we see there are many things that are shared. We can also see cultural things and agricultural things that are shared across great distances. But we also find regions where the languages cohere in terms of, and the cultures where they share a lot in this region, and this other region shares a lot, but these are different regions. So there is, there is clearly diversity in, in these various regions, but I, but I still think that uh, there's a kind of an overall similarity, and then there's then there's the contact within small regions. I don't know how much isolation you would need to, to get the linguistic diversity we have. I suspect that we've always had a fair amount of contact in the region, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you to find out whether this works or not. Uh. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, um, if you take into account four centuries of colonization, and uh, if you take into account four centuries of colonization and the huge impact in demographic distribution uh, or organ social organization, this whole picture would look much more complex. Especially, I see an, a kind of linear effort to understand the, this evolution, but when you compare what happened in the colonial era and the first couple of hundred years of, uh, of the empire, and even in the beginning of the, the, the 20th century, what looks uh, that these waves of moves and changes and, uh, and interchange seem a lot more complex than this kind of uh, simple models that we are working so far, don't you think? Yes, uh, yes I think that's a very good point. Uh, so, so if we look at the impact of, of colonial groups on the, the, the native groups, there's a huge impact on the languages. Uh, many have just disappeared. Uh, so the, the impact of the impact of causing language extinction is an extremely important one we have to take into account. If we look at history, you know, when uh, right after first arrival of the Europeans, the, the European dis diseases killed off so much of the population that there was great disruption in, in populations and in groups. And we don't know yet what the impact of that was on 
settlement patterns and groups coming together or disappearing or whatever. But we also know that, you know, that these mixed languages came up, came about only after European contact. Uh, so that's one thing. We also have to take into account that different groups were, you know, settled by missionaries into nucleated communities that they didn't have before, and that should have an impact on the kinds of patterns of communication they had. So there would be many kinds of impacts from Europeans on, but it, but that, all of that said, it still won't change the classification of the languages because we, you know, those are, those are there, they're, they're, they're set, we have those through time. Uh, it will change the, the languages we've lost, but it won't change how many there were uh, in the past. If I, I didn't say that well, but I hope you know what I meant. Okay, so I, I'll, oh. take the, I'll take just uh, one, one more before we conclude, because I know that uh, you, you have uh, the end of the week to, to talk with uh, Professor Lyle, so <laughs> yeah, the thanks. last one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the talk. It was uh, just one thing I wonder if you could maybe clarify a little on for purposes of, so uh, geneticists uh, particularly interested also in, and archaeologists who've got good methods for it, in chronology. Uh, and maybe you could say something about how well or how badly linguistics can help us with chronology. You mentioned the differences in families. Sorry, you mentioned, yeah, questions about chron chronology. You mentioned, uh, for example, the differences in that some families are big families, some families with lots of member languages, some have few member languages. But you could maybe, could you maybe say something about what that can tell us about chronology and, you know, attempts to use linguistic data for chronology, which of course aren't necessarily very effective? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question, and I didn't consider it at all, but uh, you know, when we look at some language families, the languages are so similar that we imagine that they didn't split up very long ago, that they're only very recently diversified. It would be like looking at Spanish and Portuguese and saying, well, there must have been a single language not very long in the past. Uh, uh, and then we look at other language families and we see that the languages are quite different uh, even though we can show they belong to the same language family. And so we assume that those languages must have split up, diversified in the more distant past. But, we, but it's only kind of relative chronology we get this way. We also can look at the kinds of, the kinds of changes that we can see from one language to another in these related languages and to see how the amount of it, to see whether it gives us any picture of the time or not. But yeah, so yeah, we get a relative chronology by looking at how closely related or how distantly related these languages are. But of course we don't give we don't get a very exact view of things that way. Is that what you're driving at, Paul? Yeah. I think that was an important point I should have made, so thanks for adding it. Okay. So well, let's thank you, Professor Lyle, for his talk. And uh, I'll pass. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, please. <laughs> Professor Fabrizio, you have some, some words about. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And the uh, people from the International Symposium, please just stay here a little bit for some information. OK? So thank you again. And just the beginning of an uh, interesting week. Uh, we have now. No, no. Yes. So I have some something to, to to say about the people, about the conference, about the symposium, or no, no, no. Just uh, a few okay. information. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, the tomorrow uh, we don't have any other special commitment tonight. Yeah. So you are free, but uh, tomorrow morning we should be sharp here 8 a.m. Okay, yeah, there will be a van in the quality Pampulho Hotel. You can take, but you can walk as well here. Many people said would, would prefer to walk. It's, it's quite a relatively safe area. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is typical for a, a large city, but it's not. It's a, it's a good area here around the city. And, uh, well, so you can choose between coming by bus, by van, or walking and we have students helping you is Dominique, Thomas and Fernanda, Dominique and Thomas stand up, the, these two ones here, so 
So uh, any need you have? Sorry. No, no, no. The the meat is not here. Okay, the meat is in the rectory, just a large building, like Nehemiah's building in front of here. And uh, in the fourth floor, we have a, a, a small room for about 50 people, which is the size of our meeting. So we very can discuss a lot of things in terms of a multidisciplinary perspective on the pre-Columbian times and then moving towards the post-Columbia at the end. So thank you very much for coming. For all of you who came from many parts of the world, you from Brazil, who are also here from different disciplines, different perspectives. We hope you have a very nice meeting, nice discussions, productive ones, productive, productive future collaborations. So in a way that we can actually try to reconcile a, a past that we are looking for it for a long time in your careers in different perspectives. So I, I hope you enjoy that as we have enjoyed it. in previous meeting we had in Germany in other parts and with this. I would like to thank Paul Egart for this initiative. Paul Egart is a linguist as well, and he started this in 2008, this kind of meeting, together with Dave Beresford, who is a unfortunately he is not here. So it was, I participated in two of these meetings previously. It was so much exciting and productive. We hope to reproduce it here in another moment of the science. Uh, with different perspectives, again, and now in Belo Horizonte, and hope to continue it in other parts of the world uh, that we can have this kind of conversation between disciplines. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Fabricio. So before a conclusion, I'd like to give you a welcome to all of you to Belo Horizonte, to the University of Federal University of Minas Gerais. And say that uh, we can, if you, people that don't know here, that to enjoy UFMG, you have lots of place to go and see here. It's a nice campus. Yeah, we can also Belo Horizonte is a city that, that, that have too much uh, options to at night and bars and uh, everything to take beers and talk about. Uh, they say that linguists they they, they don't talk about uh, other than linguist subject. They say that. I heard that they go, they talk linguistics. Bo, <laughs> okay, try to talk different things else tonight. So, thank you very much for coming and have a nice symposium. Okay, thank you.